We were reminded this morning, even as we gathered in our Sunday school, our small groups, just of our need for Christ. It's in Him that we have adoption as sons. It's through Him that we are brought into God's family and we are filled with God's Holy Spirit who walks with us. And if we ever begin to think that we can do this on our own, we are fools. Well, good morning to you. It is good to be with you. Um, if you can remember how to find your way there, take your copy of God's Word and turn to First Thessalonians chapter 4. And I say that because it, it, it's, it feels a little weird. I was telling Brian some of this last night, I mentioned to James earlier, like, I feel like over the last six weeks it's been a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, we were traveling back on Mother's Day and out of town, so Derek preached then, and then the next Sunday was our senior Sunday, it was already scheduled, and so James preached to us that week, and I was back for a week, and then Celso was here uh, for one of his semi-annual visits, and then, of course, the following week, we were in the hospital, and Derek was in the pulpit, and a lot of this just kind of seems like a blur to me, and I had to sit down, and this week when I was trying to study and get ready and, and remind myself of, okay, where have we been, and what are we doing, just to kind of get back into that, and some of you who maybe who have, have, have been uh, Bible teachers before, you know sometimes when you have these periods where you're away, and especially when there are a lot of other things going on in your world, and you're not sleeping very much, like, it gets weird, right, and you have to kind of reorient yourself to what's going on, but uh, the Lord is, is good and faithful, and so we're glad to be here. Uh, I want to just say, um, in light of that as well, just, um, I know I say this, it seems like every time that we're away, and I come back and say this, but I really do mean this, like, I am so grateful for just God's faithfulness to us as a body, and the ways that he has filled our congregation with people who are uh, gifted, who are called, who are equipped for ministry uh, in all sorts of different ways. And that's one of the things that's wonderful is, is, is when I'm gone and we're out of the state somewhere or when we're sitting in the hospital, like I never wake up on a Sunday morning worried about what's going to happen because God has provided, you know, for, um, you're chuckling, there may be some weird things that could happen sometimes, but this church is well cared for. And I think about that in so many different ways. Uh, yesterday, I was here um, mid-morning and uh, did a couple of things, and I, I went up to Nicholasville to Sam's Club, and just noticing as I left, there was a vehicle parked in the front parking lot, and we won't call names or whatever, but someone just here, uh, just providing service and care to our body in ways that you can see when you look around our building, right? And uh, then I went and got back, and I come back, and, and Jalen's fresh off the lawnmower, and he's been helping take care of that so that things look good when we come in here uh, this morning for worship. And uh, later that afternoon, Brian came over, and we went to North Point uh, and just did some, some ministry over there at the prison. And then when we got back, go into the kitchen to pick up a few things, and, uh, you know, the, the breakfast fairy has been there to set everything up so that it's ready for our kids to come in and fight for the best cereals and get their breakfast in the morning. I just think of all these different ways that, that God's people are at work here, and, and I'm grateful, and I mean that. I, I drove home last night just thinking on some of that. And maybe I'll take this opportunity to give you a little commercial. We Starting this Wednesday... Uh, we're going to kind of reorient some of the things we're doing on Wednesday evenings. We've been in the fellowship hall going through this uh, kind of marriage and family study for a while, this household homiletics, and we've, we, we've, we've wrapped that up, and uh, we'll start this week a new study in Psalm 119. We actually started that last summer, did the first 11 sections of that, and we're going to pick up the, the next 11 sections of that this summer, and uh, just thinking about that. So I'm going to be preaching Wednesday night here, and uh, so if you want to choose maybe not to come to that one, come to the others, you know, that's your call. Uh, but I'm going to be preaching, and Derek's going to be preaching, and Brian Boyle's going to be preaching, and Jesse Bonney's going to be preaching, and Gabe Floro's going to be preaching, and Jerry McCowan's going to be preaching, and Gary Brown's going to be preaching, and Levi Brown's going to be preaching. You ready for that, brother? You nervous a little bit? He, he, he picked toward the end of the schedule, so get a good head start. It's good, good, good thinking. That's, that's eight people, and, and there are others. In this body, James is busy with our students, or he'd be up here too. And there are others who, who are gifted and equipped to do this work. And how good is the Lord to just provide for us all of these things? And, and I was just, I mean, I don't know. Man, I'm weird. It's an emotional time. I got a new kid, right? Not sleeping much, whatever. But, um, but I'm just thinking about that. You come in here and you look around this room and you see these children 
these, these little children that are wild and crazy and test us, but they're precious. And then I look around this room, and I'm just thinking about teenagers and 20-somethings who are going to be teaching them and shepherding them someday. And so just the ways that God provides for his church, um, not just in the moment, but for generations to come. It's so cool to see the way that he's working there. So I hope that you're thankful for that. And uh, I'm just reminded of those things whenever we're away and the ways that God has been so good here. I, I've been in situations before where the idea of being sick on a weekend or having to go somewhere, it was just dread because you had nobody uh, that you could call upon. And uh, maybe you could get someone from some sort of local association or something to come, but you kind of knew like, okay, hit or miss on those, right? You just never quite know, but God is faithful. So I'm grateful for that. I'll, I'll move on from there, but, um, you know, just uh, be mindful of these things. We have much to be thankful for. We'll say as well, appreciate your uh, prayers for us, just reaching out to us and uh, providing meals and all the different things that have been happening over the last um, eight days, nine days, whatever it is. Um, we were in the hospital, had the baby. Um, you know, good Lord was, was kind to us. We, uh, we've been back and forth on this thing. The baby was breached, and so we went in to have the baby turned, and the baby had turned on her own, and so we were excited about that. And then on a Wednesday, had another ultrasound, and the baby was breached again, so they scheduled us for a C-section first thing Friday morning. Uh, but we had a doctor who uh, was uh, you know, thoughtful and patient and wanted to care for Maggie the best he could, who offered to try to manipulate the baby and turn her around and was able to do that successfully. And uh, so we uh, changed a C-section into a normal delivery, just went into the other room and started the medications and induced labor there. And uh, we're thankful for that. Maggie makes it much easier for her and recovery and all of that. And so, but thank you for praying for us and caring for us during that time. They're doing well. Uh, they plan on being here this morning. One of the other kids ended up with a fever yesterday. Uh, was better by yesterday evening, but you know how it is. We don't want to bring that in and potentially share things that you don't want. So uh, Maggie's home with, with them, but hopefully she'll be here Wednesday and be able to see everybody there. We are back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so I would invite you, if you're able, to stand with me as we read this word. We started looking a couple weeks back at the first two verses and maybe just the very first part of verse 3. We're this morning going to look through verse 8, and I'll start there in verse 1 again just to get us kind of ready to go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual morality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgresses and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. We'll stop there. You can be seated. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we confess this morning our need of you every hour of every day there is not one breath that we take that does not come from you there's not one beat of our heart that you have not ordained everything that we are everything that we have Lord it all comes from you and God we confess as believers that we are only your children by your mercy by faith in Jesus Christ, who you sent as a sacrifice for our sin, we are brought into your family. We are adopted as your children. We are made heirs of the promise. And we are given your Holy Spirit to fill us and to guide us and to teach us and to strengthen us and to help us call out to you as our Father, our Abba. 
that dear and precious one who watches over us and provides for our needs. And so, God, I pray as we think about the way that we live our lives and as we consider what you have to say to us in your word, that we would receive those instructions as the instructions of a good and gracious and loving father who cares for his children. That we would not be caught in a trap of trying to perform in order to earn your mercy, but because we have received your mercy, because we know your love, we would desire to do those things that please you, knowing that these commands are for our good. And so, God, I pray as we deal with the topic at hand, and as we consider the call you give for us to be above reproach, to allow not even a hint of sexual immorality to be present in our lives, God, that we would come in submission to your word, that we would come under the leadership and the influence of your Holy Spirit, that you would convict us of sin, and that you would call us to live righteously, to put away every wicked thought and every wicked deed and to fix our eyes on Jesus who lived perfectly and righteously and who has given us his righteousness and made us children. God, would you help us to live like children of our Father and our King. God, let your word and your spirit do their work to convict to call, to challenge, to encourage. God, you know our needs. You know every one of us. You know everything about us. You know every thought that enters our mind, every inclination of our heart. God, would you work in us as you see fit and as only you can. Guide us as we go through this time. Be with others who are worshiping in other places. May you be glorified in the preaching of your word and the worship of your people. God, in the salvation of sinners, as you draw us to Christ. We pray these things in his precious and holy name. Amen. Well, the last time we were together in this letter, I told you that chapter 4 brings us to a bit of a turning point. In the first three chapters, Paul is giving very high marks to the church there at Thessalonica. He's rejoicing at how the gospel has taken hold in their lives and how they have been faithful in their service to Christ. The gospel had been preached to them and it had come to them not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. They had repented. They had turned away from their sin. They had put their faith in Jesus Christ. They had cast down their idols, choosing instead to serve the living and the true God, and they had become faithful evangelists, taking the gospel to other people all throughout that region of Macedonia. This is a church that had started well. But as we considered last time we were together, it's important not only that they start well, but they continue to make progress in their faith. They had to keep moving forward with the Lord. They had to be in God's word, seeking to obey him. And little by little, they had to bring more and more of their lives under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And it's important that we understand that this is necessary for us as well. It's good that we preach the gospel. It's good that we call on sinners to repent. And it's, it's, it's good, it's glorious, it's wonderful when that happens. Every one of us is commanded by God's word to turn from our sin and to put our hope in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. And the consequences of that are eternal. Let me say that to every one of you here today. You are, you are commanded by God to repent and to believe the gospel. And I pray that you will. So I don't want to imply at all that that's not important. It's, it's extremely important. But, but we need to understand this, that if all we ever do is tell people, hey, you just need to get saved, and then we never expect anything else of them, then we've done them a disservice. If we do that as a church, as pastors in the pulpit, if we do that as parents toward our children, if we do that in our relationships to our family members and to our friends, if all we ever say is, look, just be a Christian, 
and we never go anywhere but that, then we've done a disservice. And if we think in our own lives that, that all we need to do is just become a Christian, maybe get baptized and put our name on a list somewhere at a church, and then we're done, we've missed out on what it means to live as a Christian, as a child of God. I remember still as a, as a senior in high school, one of our youth leaders, something they said during one of our small group discussions we were having, he compared the Christian life to climbing up that escalator that's going down. Have you ever done that before? Go to a mall or an airport or something like that where they've got those moving staircases. Some of you kids probably never seen one before. I don't know. But like, you know, you have these things and, and there was this challenge, right? Every kid walks up at a certain point and you're like, hey, I got a better idea. And so we, you, we, we, we think, hey, we can do this. And so it was compared, though, this walk with Christ to, to trying to go up the escalator, that's going down. And, you know, ideally when we come to those things, we step on the one that's going up, and, and all you have to do is stand there, right? And it's going to do the work for you. It's going to take you up to the top. And that's how a lot of us seem to think that this whole Christian thing works, right? We pray the prayer. We sign the card. We join a church. We step on at ground level, and we just think, hey, the rest of this is just an easy ride all the way to glory, right? That, a lot of people seem to think that way. And yet it doesn't work out that way, right? It's not what the Bible tells us. The Christian life is compared to running a race where you have to endure. Or a boxing match where we're going to fight hard so that we're not the one who's getting knocked down. It's about striving. It's about discipline. It's about beating our own selves into submission to Christ. We're even told that we have to die to ourselves. That we have to take up a cross every day. So this youth leader, he said, it's actually a lot more like stepping onto that escalator that's coming down. And if you want to make it to the top, you're going to have to put some real work into that. But here's the thing. The moment that you decide you've gone far enough and you decide that you're going to stand still, what happens? Immediately, you're in decline. You start to move backwards you're, you're going back to where you started. So what happens when in our walk with Christ we decide that we've done enough? I, I've studied the Bible, went to Bible school, went to Sunday school, heard the preacher preach. I think I know this thing well enough. I really don't need to study it anymore. I know the Lord, he's my Savior, we're, we've got a good thing going here, but I don't really need to pray anymore, I've got those things sorted out. I know where I stand, I don't need to really worry about the truth anymore, I know Jesus, and that's enough. So there's really nothing else I need to do. Brothers and sisters, like trying to go up that down escalator, the moment that we decide that we're going to stop that we're no longer going to press ahead, that we're going to be satisfied with where we are, very quickly we find ourselves in spiritual decline. And that's why we're called in God's word to endure, to persevere, to strive until the very end when salvation's work is finished in us. I think it was Jennifer that made a reference in our Sunday school this morning, just talking about how easy it is to drift, right? And you think about your kids going to the beach, and they go into the water, and before you know it, they're halfway down the beach, right? And you didn't do that on purpose. You just, you just drift down, right? Uh, it didn't take any effort, and that's part of the problem. You've got you to work to stay where you're supposed to be. And so we can't ever reach the point where we're satisfied or where we think we've arrived or that we can just quit, right, because we've done enough. And that's kind of where Paul takes us here in chapter 4. He's been reminding these believers all along of the wonderful things that have been and that continue to be. He's given them all sorts of praise. But he says when he gets into chapter 4, this is no time then to stop. This is no time to be satisfied. This is no time to think, okay, we've done everything we need to do, and now we can just kind of ride this thing out. It's not going to work that way, right? And so he begins to give them some instructions about how they need to live their lives until the Lord comes. 
And so in the first couple of verses, we saw some general principles here for Christian living. First, we saw that we must live to please God. You see it there, verse 1. Finally, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. So it's not that we say, okay, I've done everything I do. God's pleased with me. I'm finished. No, he says you've got to strive to do that more and more. So we have to live continually to please God. Second, we saw that we must obey God. Paul writes about the instruction that had been given through the Lord Jesus and by the authority of the Lord Jesus. In other words, this isn't us. We didn't just come to you and say, hey, we got some ideas. No, God has spoken. And when God speaks, we are obligated to hear and to obey. And so we must obey God's word. And the reason for doing all these things is that it is the will of God. You get there, verse, verse 3, right at the beginning. This is God's will for you. So that's what we saw a few weeks ago. These, these general principles for how do we live this Christian life. We live to please God. We obey his word. And we don't do it in one moment. We do it always, right? It's, it's a pattern. It's a lifestyle of living to please God and to obey his word because that is his will for us. And after saying that and explaining, look, you've got to keep going in the faith, he starts to address some specific things in their lives. Some specific struggles, I think, that he knew they would have. Some specific hardships that they would have to deal with. Some areas where they would be tempted maybe to neglect their discipline and would fall short in these areas in ways that were not pleasing to God. And what we'll see is that the same struggles he's addressing in them are struggles that are real for us. And so this word is good for us and important for us. And so he's going to address these specific struggles, and we're going to deal with the first one of those this morning as we consider the believer's call to holiness, particularly when it comes to the area of sexual purity. Now, let's just acknowledge this can be a difficult topic to deal with, uh, especially in a setting like this. Um, and really, for that reason, a lot of churches just don't ever talk about any of this stuff. And I think that's to our harm. Um, at least they don't talk about it in ways that are meaningful. You know, it's, 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 it's simple. It can be uncomfortable to talk about these things. We're talking about things that are very personal. We can talk about things that be very sensitive depending upon your audience. We have a room full of people here, some of them old, some of them young, some of them single, some of them married, different levels of knowledge and understanding of all of this. And there are some things that probably don't need to be discussed at all sometimes in mixed company like this. And so you've had in past years a kind of cultural expectation that these things would never be talked, out, talked about outside the home and outside the particular relationship between a husband and a wife. But I think in neglecting to deal with some of these things from the pulpit, in smaller gatherings with other people, maybe just in personal relationships of mentoring and discipleship, when we've refused to deal with these things, we've, we've not served each other well. So I get it. Conversations can be weird. Hopefully we'll avoid that this morning. Uh, you're getting too, too weird today. Another reason we often avoid this topic in the church is that it's just something that's often not well received. If you want to talk about the idol of our day, uh, the, the, the great uh, force that is driving our culture, what is it? It's this sexual revolution that just continues to go forward at breakneck speed. And so we can look on the one hand and think about what's happening outside the church, and that's easy, by the way, for us to do that and to point fingers at all of that. And so we can criticize all sorts of different things. But look, we know those things are going to happen, right? Lost people are going to behave like lost people. The darkness hates the light. It's always been true. It always will be true. And so if you confront the prevailing sin of the culture, you're going to get some pushback on that, right? You're going to have some people who are going to hate you as a result of your taking a stand on some of those things. You'll make your enemy, some enemies along the way. But here's what I've really found more challenging uh, through years of local church ministry is that a lot of times people in the church, people who claim to be the church, who confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord but are not living under his lordship when it comes to their own sexual ethic, we find that those people don't like to be confronted in their sin either. I don't like to be confronted in mine, right? We don't like to deal with these things that we know are the struggles of our own heart. 
And so the temptation is just to ignore the topic altogether. Or when we do talk about this stuff, just to go after the easy stuff, the low-hanging fruit, to lament about social ills, but to ignore the messier issues that affect all of us in our daily lives. So I could stand up here and I could passionately opine on what's happening during the month of June all around us, right? And we could talk about Pride Month as people boast in their sin. And, and I could talk about that in some certain ways and get a lot of amens, right? We can talk about drag queen story hours or Planned Parenthood, and, and, and we could certainly all get fired up and excited about that, right? Hey, those things are evil, and we should call them out. But if we start addressing our own marital dysfunction, if we start talking about the dangers of so much of the permissive parenting that happens here that puts our children in compromising situations, if we talk about things like modesty and dress, if we talk about the filth that we're constantly pumping into our own homes, into our minds, and into our eyes through all sorts of entertainment, if we talk about the pervasive use of pornography even in the church, if we talk about how we hand over smartphones to children who have no idea how to interact with these things in the world, without an ounce of godly discretion. And the list could go on and on and on. But you get the point. Things start to get real personal, right? And we start to say, hey, that hurts a little bit. Or, or maybe you're crossing some boundaries and things get weird and we get uncomfortable and people get mad. So what do we do in the church a lot of times? Just let it be. And we're not serving each other well when we do that. It's necessary that we talk about what the Bible says when it comes to a faithful, godly, sexual ethic. We live in a world that is absolutely obsessed with sex and with sexuality and, and the many ways that that can be expressed. We live in a time when good is called evil and evil is called good. And you can't escape being confronted by all of this, no matter how hard you try, because it's everywhere. Try to go take in any popular movie these days and, and see if you don't have just a little bit of shame. Frankly, you can't turn on kids programming at your home anymore without being inundated with certain ideas and images, magazines and billboards and social media ads. Y'all on Facebook, right? If you go scrolling through, you think, what in the world is going on here? And they just drop things in your timeline and your little feed there. And like my kid's looking over my shoulder. I'm like, I don't know where it came from. I'm sorry. It's constant, right? You can't get away from the agenda. But more than that, we can't escape what is in our own hearts. We, we, we can't get away from our own desires, right? The longings we have to take something that God has made, that he has made good and beautiful and wonderful and given to us as a gift, but to use that gift in ways that are marred by sin, that dis distort God's plan and God's purpose in pursuit of sinful self-indulgence. So it's important that we understand what God has to say about these issues and that we strive more and more to please the Lord and to obey his word because this is his will for us. So, we're going to endeavor to just consider these words and we're going to keep things pretty general in this conversation. But we're going to talk about just some of the things that we find here with regards to a Christian sexual ethic. Living in a way that pleases God through obedience to his word. So a few things I want to draw from the text here and we'll work through these and hope for the Lord will use this in some way in our lives. A few things we can see here when it comes to this call, one is, is this. We'll just start here. This is the simple one. Verse number three. It is God's will that you abstain from sexual immorality. It doesn't get much more plain than that. It's directly stated here in the text. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, colon, 
that you abstain from sexual immoralities. Let's talk about a few things here. First, we, we come to that word sanctification. Sanctification speaks of holiness, of purification, of consecration. It speaks of a life that's been set apart in service to and for the glory of God. Uh, Baptist Catechism of uh, it's 1813, I think, the Charleston Association. Uh, Keats was involved in, in developing that, Benjamin Keats, but uh, just it's one that I learned growing up, and so, or, or well, I say growing up, later teenage years and whatever, but it defines sanctification this way as the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. And that's a theme that, that, that's played out throughout the scripture. And we find it, for example, in the book of Romans, and this is one of the references they use when they're putting together that catechism statement. Go to Romans chapter 6, and we're told that we have been buried in the likeness of Christ's death so that we can be raised then to do what? To walk in newness of life. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So one of the reasons that we have been redeemed is so that we would not be slaves to sin, but that we would live righteously. You go to chapter 8, and you'll find that we were foreknown and predestined and called and justified and glorified in order that we would be conformed to the image of his Son. So God's desire for us is that we would become like Jesus. And we, in Sunday school this morning, we, we had that little line from Keller that, you know, take it for what you will. He uses a lot of fl- a fancy, flowery words. He said, look, God looks at you, and he sees you just as he sees Jesus. And he does that by its own mercy because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to us, right? We are made righteous in Christ, but then we are called to live righteously and to reflect the mercies of God in Christ, to live in a way that reflects who we are by God's mercy and salvation. And so God's desire is that we become like Jesus. The will of God then is our sanctification and absolutely critical to our sanctification. If we want to live in the will of God is this command that we abstain from sexual immorality. That phrase, sexual immorality, comes from the Greek word porneia, which can refer to all sorts of sexual deviancy. Essentially, it speaks of any sort of sexual expression that is outside of what God has ordained, and we know what God has ordained, right? God has established this one flesh union, this relationship between a husband and a wife that is, that is meant to be for life, Right? And so we have this covenant that we make to each other before the Lord to live as one flesh. And that is God's standards, right? That is the ideal. That's what he's placed before us. And that means that any other form of sexual expression outside that marriage covenant then is a deviation from that. It is sexual immorality. And that means the big stuff that's easy for us to call out, right? James read some stuff where there was a little bit of a list of a few different things that are going on, and there's some more detailed lists that are given in Scripture of all the different ways that that this kind of rebellion against God's norm can be played out in our lives. And so we can talk about sex outside of marriage or same-sex relationships or uh, uh, violence in sexuality or incest or bestiality, all sorts of things that are... Some of y'all like dying right now. Like, I'm going to have a conversation with my kids later. Sorry. But all these things that are called out and condemned in Scripture. And we can look at that and we can see the big stuff. But Scripture tells us there ought not, not, not to be even a hint of any of this in our lives. And so that means that it gets into a lot of what we might want to downplay and consider the smaller stuff, right? Any forms of physical contact that stir up desire in us that's not holy. The lingering looks the uncontrolled thoughts, the coarse joking, the things that we put into our hearts and mind through music and movies and books and all of that junk, the things we put before our eyes when we turn on the television or we scroll through our phones, all of those sorts of things. And again, the list could be long. 
there's no room for any of it. What's the will of God for us? Our sanctification, that we would abstain from sexual immorality. You know, it's interesting, that word for sexual morality, pornea, it's often associated in Scripture also with idolatry, which is important for us to understand. For the Thessalonians, that was quite literal. We, we talked when we started this book just kind of about that city and, and what it was. This is a major Roman city where there's a whole lot of commerce and there's a whole lot of resources around. There's a major road that runs right through the city that can take you from one end of the empire to the other. And so this is a place where all sorts of people from all sorts of places gather and it's a city that's overrun with idols. And there's a temple on every corner to this idol or to that idol. And some of you know that a big part of worship in many of those pagan temples had to do with perverse sexual expressions. Prostitutes for hire that people would pay and lie to themselves and to everyone else around them and call it an act of worship. So you had this very real, very present reality of idolatry at work through this sexual misconduct there among the Thessalonians. But idolatry is often expressed as well through self-worship. We hit on some of that this morning in our study in Galatians, right? Because these are people who didn't grow up under the law. The Galatians were pagans right? They had temples where they worshipped idols. They had those idols in their home. They bowed before these articles of wood and metal and stone, and they said, these are our gods. And he said, they're no gods at all, and they all they can do is enslave you. But he says, look, if you begin to put yourself under the law and you begin to try to earn a righteousness of your own, what are you doing? You're going back to the same thing. It's just idolatry in another form. And ultimately, you're trusting in yourself, and you're not trusting in Christ. And our idolatry is often expressed through self-worship. And that will find itself played out in the pursuit of personal pleasure, above a love for God, above a love for our neighbor. And we are well acquainted, are we not, with this form of idolatry. So sexual morality is rooted in self-worship that rebels against God's design in the pursuit of personal pleasure and satisfaction. And what does God say to us about that? There's no room for that in the life of the believer. What is God's will for those who hope in him that we be sanctified, conformed into the image of Christ, and that we abstain from, that we distance ourselves from, that we discipline ourselves against sexual immorality. He goes on to say in verse 4 that as a part of this process of sanctification that each one must know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Now your translation may say something like this, that each one should know how to possess his vessel. This body is an instrument that's been given to us And we are to rule over our bodies, not to be ruled by the passions of our flesh. We've been made in God's image and for his glory. Romans 9 speaks of those who are in Christ as vessels of mercy who have been fashioned for honorable purposes. And so that is how we ought to live. As a people who are filled with the Spirit of God, we're called to bear the fruit of the Spirit, among which is self-control. And so we cannot allow ourselves to be mastered by our sinful desires, but rather we master our sinful desires through spiritual discipline, and we bring those things under the lordship of Christ in submission to his word. And so rather than being marked by sin and self-worship, the life of the believer ought to be marked by holiness. Sanctification, reflecting God's glory as we become more like Jesus. And by honor, as we recognize the worth of every person who is made in God's image and we treat them accordingly. And that means us in how we use our own bodies and that means in how we deal with everyone else. So we have to know how to control our own bodies. 
And that means we have to understand our weaknesses. That means we have to know our temptations. We have to know those situations where we are more likely to fall into sin, the places we should not go, the people we should not be with, the access that we should not have. And then we've got to deal with those things accordingly. What does Scripture say about what happens when we find ourselves stumbling in sin? If your right hand causes you to sin, what are you going to do? Cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, what are you going to do? You're going to gouge it out. And it's not a literal call for us to dismember ourselves. But look, we're told those things that would cause us to struggle and to stumble and to fall to the temptation of sin, we've got to root those out of our lives. And that only works when we begin to shine light into that darkness. We begin to let other people in. And we look for accountability from our brothers and sisters. And we wage war. We must know how to control our own bodies in holiness and in honor. Note that that is directly connected to our relationship with God. He tells us there we've got to know how to control our own body in holiness and honor, not, he says in verse 5, in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So what's he saying? This kind of life, that is just driven by your passions, that's out of control, if you are driven by the passions of your own lust, that's not a picture of a life that's been transformed by the power of the gospel. That's not a picture of one who is walking and living in the will of God in obedience to his word and seeking to do his will. This is how the Gentiles live who do not know God. It's not for those who belong to Christ. Sexual immorality is a mark of an unbeliever. And it has no place in the life of the one who belongs to Christ. So it affects our relationship with God. And and notice, very serious when it comes to how we involve others in that. He talks about this rebellion against God, and it's the Gentiles who live this way who do not know God. But he says there in verse 6, as part of this abstaining from sexual immorality, that no one should transgress or wrong his brother or his sister in this matter. Transgress means to do wrong, right? To sin, to do harm. He talks about wronging our brother, to defraud, to take advantage of. This is someone who does not have control of their passions, and so what do they do? They look to the people around them, and they use them, and they abuse them for their own personal pleasure. And so often, when they're finished using them, what do they do? They throw them away. Y'all know it's true. Some of you lived it. We are warned that we're not only sinning against God, but we are sinning against others. Understand that when you involve someone else, and your pursuit of ungodly passion, you are bringing them with you in that sin. You are transgressing. You are wronging. You are sinning against. You are defrauding. You are taking advantage. And again, this has no place in the life of the follower of Christ. It is God's will that we abstain from sexual immorality. And we need to know this, that God takes sin seriously. We tend to live our lives so often as if the things that we do in the privacy of our own minds or in our own hearts or in our own homes when we're doing our own thing and nobody else is affected by this and I'm just going to do this and it's not going to matter. And we, we tend to think that like there, there's, there's no consequence for that, right? That we can just quietly sin and it's not a big deal and, and we, just, we, we, we treat it like it's nothing. And yet God takes it very, very seriously. There's no room for this. What's God's will for you? That you be sanctified, that you abstain, and that you obey God, that you're not sinning against him. That's what the Gentiles do who don't know God, and you're not doing harm to your brother. But when you do, there's a price to be paid. 
Again, there in verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in honor and holiness, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. And what does he say? Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. The beginning of that verse 6, Paul uses the language of transgression and wrongdoing. Go back to verse 5. We're rebelling against God. We're living like people who don't know God. We're wronging the people around us. But we need to recognize when we sin against God, when we sin against the people who are made in the image of God, he does not take that lightly. And so we are warned in verse 6 that God will judge. It says that he is an avenger in all these things. What's an avenger? Not the movie guys. An avenger is one who brings punishment for wrongdoing in the pursuit of justice, which maybe there's a connection there. Sin must always be accounted for. And we know as believers that our sin has been placed on Christ. By faith in him, we are forgiven of all sin, past, present, and future. So on the one hand, we ought to rejoice in that and be thankful, right? God is abundantly merciful to us in ways that we do not deserve. But we also need to recognize this, that just because our sins have been forgiven and we have the hope of heaven, that does not mean that we will never face a consequence because of our sin. Thought about this some last night, right? Brian and I went over and met some other people at North Point, and that was a whole experience. First time I've been inside the grounds of a state prison. Um, thankful for that. And, um, you know, going through that whole process of getting in there, and then we gather with about 50 men uh, who come to worship, and I'm sure there are all sorts of different reasons that they probably want to come to the chapel and get some time out of their cells and do whatever they're going to do, but there were some men there who and were just were passionate in their worship of the Lord. And I pray that that's genuine and that's real and, and not just something to pick up in the moment. But here's the deal. They can know Christ as Savior, and their sins can be forgiven, but they're still going to spend their night on a cot in a cell because there are consequences for sin. And we may not have put ourselves on the other side of that fence. And maybe our sins, our offenses, aren't the ones that rise to the criminal level that will put us behind bars, but it would be foolish of us to think that we can continue in sin and in rebellion against God and face no consequence. Scripture tells us that the Lord disciplines the one that he loves, and sometimes that discipline is painful. John MacArthur said some stuff about this, and he, he gets pretty direct in it. He says, if a believer engages in sexual immorality, God the avenger may judge all these things, by allowing one or more of several consequences to affect that believer's life. For example, the outcome can be a severely damaged marriage, accompanied by the loss of family love and respect. The sin could lead to a divorce. God may chasten the person by allowing him or her to be afflicted with venereal disease or some other physical affliction. Or the sin could result in the absence of blessing or the presence of a greater than average number of trials and troubles or even an untimely death. Sexual sin by a believer will certainly result to some degree even in loss of eternal reward. Not that we would lose the hope of our salvation, but there are blessings we will not know because of our persistence in sin. All sin has consequences. And that means that sexual immorality has consequences. No matter how secret and hush-hush we may try to keep our sin, it always has a way of finding us out. 
Some of you have had to experience that in very difficult ways, right? The cost can be many, and they can be great. And the Thessalonians have been warned about this. He says, I told you this before. I, I, I warned you solemnly. He knew their problems. He knew their struggles. Obedience to Christ for these Thessalonians meant turning from idolatry and turning from everything that went with it. And so that meant that pagan worship, that was really self-worship because it satisfied their own wicked desires, had to go. But here's the thing. Don't, don't, don't convince yourself that just because I don't go to the temple anymore, that sexual morality is still going to be an issue for me. Look, by the grace of God, some of us have experienced great victory in this area. But we have to know that sin is always lurking. And so we need to be warned solemnly of the dangers of sin, the consequences of sin. For the Lord is an avenger in all these things. He will bring justice. And that justice may come at great cost for those who live in rebellion against him. God takes sexual sin seriously, and so must we. We cannot take our sin lightly. There's always a price to be paid. So we know God's will for us that we abstain from sexual morality. We know that God takes this sin seriously. And can I say that can be scary for us? Because we know the things that lurk in our own hearts and minds. We, we know the thoughts, the inclinations of our, uh, all these things that, that, that tend to just always be present. And we find ourselves maybe like Paul. I, I, I want to do the right thing, but I keep messing it up. There, there are things I say, I'm not going to do it anymore, and yet that's where I go. And, and maybe we find ourselves saying, who then can deliver me from this wretched body of death? Jesus. It's the last part of this. I, I just want to remind us, and perhaps this can be an encouragement to us because this is hard stuff. This is difficult truth. It, it, it leads to all sorts of conviction because here's the deal. I don't have to start naming things because you know them already. Y'all know the things in your own heart. You got the Holy Spirit. He's, he's calling those things conviction right now. And there's, there's, there's shame that you carry on this, right? But here's the thing. And this is where we'll end. We are given an assurance here. This is God's will for us. This is what he wants for us. This is what God demands of us, and he takes it seriously, and so should we. There are consequences for our sin, but, but this is what we see, and this is beautiful. And I'll sum it up this way, that what God demands of us, he also provides for us. Verse 7 says that God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Now, essentially, there's a restatement here in verse 7 of verse 3. God's will for us is that we abstain from sexual immorality, but we have not been called for impurity. We were not saved so that we could continue in sin, but we are called, he says, in holiness. I, I don't want us to miss something there. Because it might seem small, but I think it's actually pretty significant. We, we, we've been talking a lot about purpose. What is it that God wants or doesn't want for us? But here, I, I think we can, we can talk just a little bit about position. Who are we? If we are in Christ. Notice he does not say here that we have been called for holiness, although it's important that we walk in holiness before the Lord. But he says that rather we are called in holiness. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. This is who we are. 
because this is who God has made us. Understand that. Believers are called in holiness. Go back again to our small groups this morning, right? We are in Christ, by faith, in Jesus. We are adopted then as sons and daughters of God. And God no longer looks at us as that sinner who stands condemned, but one who is robed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has called us in holiness. And so we are given, empowered, indwelt with everything that we need then to be able to walk forward in holiness. We are new in Christ. And so while any failure to obey these commands is a failure to obey God, that's verse 8, right? Whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God. Go back to the beginning. This is not us. This is an instruction that comes to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. God has spoken. And so when you disobey what God has said, you are accountable to God. But He has provided by his mercy, everything that we need to resist, to wage war against sin, to walk in holiness and obedience to him. And he has filled us with his Holy Spirit. We we hit on this dynamic this morning, right? In Christ, we become the children of God. And through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to live as children of God. When we disregard this, we disregard not man but God, but he gives us what? He gives his Holy Spirit to you. What did Jesus say of the Spirit? That he would be our helper who would be with us forever, that he would dwell with us and be in us, that he would teach us all things and bring to remembrance the teachings of Christ. We're told that the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment, that he will guide us to all truth, that he will glorify Christ in us, that he will give us the power to be faithful witnesses of the gospel, which includes, by necessity, the faithful testimony of our lives as we live in obedience to God's word, in his will, for his glory. Think about the things that James read earlier for us, right? In that letter to the Corinthians, this long list of of sin and debauchery that leads to destruction. Those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But what does he say? That's what you were. It's not who you are. Because you have been washed, and you have been sanctified, and you have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And since the Spirit now dwells within us, we are a temple of the Lord, not our own, bought with a price. And so we glorify God with our bodies. You go a little later in that letter in this context of sexual immorality and idolatry, which, as we've already seen, can be one and the same. We're given this promise that there is no temptation that has overtaken us that is not common to man, and that God is faithful, and he will not let us be tempted beyond our ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that we will be able to endure. We have been called by God, into holiness, by faith in Jesus Christ, given his righteousness, and then we are filled with his Holy Spirit to empower us to walk in righteousness as we seek to please him and to obey his word as we seek to do his will, which is sanctification in us, that we abstain from sexual immorality. God has made us holy in Christ. He's given his Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our redemption. And so what God demands of us, he also provides for us and has done so richly. So as we deal with these issues in our own lives, we know that we're surrounded by this all the time and it lurks within us. We are called to fight against sin, to fight these battles, to keep on going, to all the more strive to please God and obey his word and to do his will until he comes. And so we don't like to do hard things, right? 
And so sometimes if the fight is hard, we just throw in the towel and give up and say it's going to be what it's going to be. We don't have that liberty as followers of Jesus. God takes our sins seriously, and so must we. So, we are called then, by the will of God, to be sanctified, to abstain from sexual morality in all its forms, and to live our lives for the glory of God, knowing that he has given us everything that we need as we engage this battle. I want to challenge you, those areas of your life where you are hiding out in the dark, to pull back the curtain and turn on the light. And the darkness runs from the light. That process might be painful. It may cost you some things, but it's worth it. Look to your brothers and sisters. Look to your spouse. Look to a friend. Seek accountability. Confess your sins to those you've sinned against. Confess your sins to God and receive the mercy that he freely gives. We are his sons and daughters by faith in Christ. We are filled with his spirit and we can cry out to our Abba Father and know that he will hear and that he will give us mercy. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word that confronts us in our sin, that exposes the wickedness of our hearts, but that God points us to the mercy that is ours through your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray today that we would know that mercy. For those who are here who maybe have never believed your gospel, who have never put their faith in the Lord Jesus, that they would realize there is a Savior who is ready to forgive, to bring them into his family, to adopt them as children and heirs, to give them all the blessings of the promise, to take their sin upon himself and to give them his righteousness. Will you help us know that we can be forgiven and we can be free? And God, just as that is true of the one who is here today who is lost, it's true of the believer who's struggling with sin right now. God, you offer us mercy and pardon through your Son, Jesus Christ. You tell us that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive our sins. And so, God, would you help some of us who are struggling now to quit hiding in the dark, to step into the light, to welcome the accountability of your people, to confess our sins, to receive your mercy. And as people who are called to holiness in Christ and who are filled with the Holy Spirit, to live and walk in a way that pleases to you, I pray that there would be not even a hint of sexual immorality among us, but that our lives would give testimony to the radical power to change that is in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. May our walk and our witness stand together for our good and for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.